So, um, so I think some pretty interesting models that are going out there. Some of these, some of these are you know peer peer. Some of them are big companies. Um, just some really interesting uh, you know models out there. So, so here's here's another example of a company that I think is fascinating. Um, it's a company called Sanergy, uh, and they actually take uh, human waste. So they put in all these toilets in slums, and you know they have entrepreneurs who have sort of their own uh, business. They then you know bring it to a central processing center and, and uh, move it to a, a facility, and that facility actually produces energy, and then the byproduct of that energy is fertilizer. So this company has made a profit center out of shit. <laughs> it's pretty impressive, right? And so they have reimagined this became this was a problem where it was a cost center for the community that it was in, or a health issue, and now it's actually a profit center. So they're sort of reimagining the way the business can be done. It's, 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 it's pretty inspiring. So I've had the, um, the, uh, the, the luck, uh, if you will, of being involved with eight companies recently that uh, I think, uh, for those of you who uh, were in this room, the last one got to hear Alan talk about Light of Africa. So we, I run a program um, called Impact Engine, and the idea is uh, it's a venture accelerator. So we're focused on building um, or uh, helping for-profit companies that address an environmental and or societal issue. So we did a call for applicants and um, we got a number of applications. We then went through those applications and figured out the companies that, that we felt we could help the most um, and sort of met our model. We have a couple requirements in that we want the companies to be able to um, the, so we have to believe that we can help them. We have to believe that the entrepreneur is coachable. And we have to have the product and the business model, or the mission and the business model intertwine. So it's not a buy one, give one, or 10% of profits go to some charity or something like that. Now, there's anything wrong with that. I think those are awesome models too. But those models are certainly hard for police and, you know, Part of it, like I talked about earlier, is, is we're, you know, a lot of these companies need a lot of capital or need capital. And our concern with is if you're giving product away uh, that sure can be considered a marketing cost, but at the same time, um, you're giving profits away, which is sort of not in line with your investors' um, your investors' ideas of return of their capital. So in a model in which the business model and the mission are intertwined, so if you sell one of your products, you're actually solving the problem uh, while at the same time being able to make money from solving that problem. So here's you know, a list of, uh, a small list of many others who are also doing, being very, in, you know, uh, very, being very creative. Most of these are um, for profit, there's a few non-profit out here, and actually it's something I should have said earlier. My lens is mostly through a, a for profit perspective. That's the world that I know. Most of the businesses that I've been involved with, or all the businesses that I've been involved with, have been, it's been their goal, they've not always been successful. Um, but, you know, really taking it, I do think there's a place for, for nonprofits in the world. There's certain segments that are going to be hard. I think that number is, that, that place is shrinking. I think you're starting to see some um, entrepreneurs who are creating really interesting business models that are starting to go after sort of the bottom of the pyramid, the pyramid of those bottom billion, which is really about two and a half or three billion people. Um, on the planet, but you, you take even companies like General um, General Motors, right? So they are now shipping their cars peer-to-peer -peer car sharing ready. So they've got, a, I think it's either Relay Ride or Get Around, one of those two that they've got a relationship with, and now, so when you buy a new GM car, it is already set up to be peer-to-peer -peer shared. Because every time, and, and there's been a lot of, um, so I did some work with IGO, which is a local or Chicago regional peer-to-peer um, -peer car sharing company, every time they put another car, so cars sit up idle on average 22 to 23 hours a day, so unused, right? So you've made all this, bent all this metal and tracked all this aluminum out of the ground, steel, um, it just sits there most of the time. So what uh, I go and, and um, others in Zipcar found is that every time they put a car in a neighborhood, you can actually uh, document about 14 cars coming off the street. Either that's either people selling them or uh, deferring buying them. Uh, and what you see, what IGO's biggest challenge is, frankly, is that people start off, they use the car a lot in the first few months, and then it slowly starts to drift off because everyone figures out how to use mass transit or bike or uh, walking, that kind of stuff. So IGO has this problem that they're too good at what they do. Um, and so it's a really interesting uh, problem. And, and GM is starting to recognize that they can't 
continue to sell cars. There's only so much road space in the world, so they got to think about new ways to look at their business model. You look at um, a company like Herman Miller. All right, they make office chairs. These really high-end office chairs. And so what Herman Miller started to do is they actually now snap a lot of their products together because so they don't glue anymore. And so what that means is now, at the end of the product's life, they can unsnap everything and actually recycle it. So once you take two products from two different materials and you glue it together, you can never, almost never recycle it or you have to downcycle it to something else. You can never get it back to the purity, at least at a cost, a cost structure that's reasonable. And so now if you look at all of their products, and Herman Miller sort of has led that particular industry, they are not now all, you know, a lot of the office furniture products are now starting to be built the way they're being sent. At least the, the stuff that you, you know, um, uh, is not glue, toxic glue, and, and things you wouldn't want to mess with anyway. But all the, the, you know, a lot of these big companies are starting to move in that direction. You know, I, I came from the tech world um, where it was purely about technology. So, you know, OpenTable was, you know, got to go public and. Um, you know, I, sat, I sit on the board of a company called Grubhub, which is you know purely about technology. I sit on, you know, I've done a bunch of investing in other really you know sort of core technology stuff that again like the primary goal. But what I'm seeing here, and what I've been seeing as over this sort of last year and a half, as I've really been immersing into this, is this really sort of special opportunity of, you know, um, sorry the, the fonts aren't working out real well in here. I guess I should send the fonts next time too. So, um, but the uh, so the rise of the impact entrepreneur, uh, and I, I think there's um, a broad movement that's happening, or yeah, happening. A movement's probably the wrong word that I, I think is pretty special. So, um, who is, who, you know, a couple things about who this impact entrepreneur is from my perspective, uh, my perception. So, there, you know, it's no longer enough just to make money. I've said that. But it's also no longer enough just to have a mission, right, in, in my opinion, right? I, I think that. If you look at the amount of capital, so $300 billion a year were donated last year to charities, so real dollars. But if you look at the amount of capital that for-profit businesses raised last year, it's in the trillions of dollars, multi-trillions of dollars. So let's go figure out how to move some of that money into areas that actually solve issues. And I think there's, like I've said, big opportunities to, to be able to do that. So it's not, it's not one or the other anymore. In my opinion, it has to be both. And I think, you know, I've talked about some of the competitive reasons for that. So, and I also, they also see that while government and NGOs play a very important role, it's just, the, 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 the challenges are just too big. And not that they're just not too big, is that they're finding some really uh, innovative and creative and uh, sometimes it's layered capital ways to solve some of these issues. And so I think you're seeing these really creative models that are coming out. I mean, you look at someone like, um, I mean, you can you can argue whether it's pure, you know, social or not. Uh, but you look at someone like Airbnb, right? In, in that, who would have ever thought that you could loan out your couch and make money on it, or loan out a bed and make money? You know, I mean, just really interesting models that are starting to emerge out there. And who, who would have thought you could ever make money on shit? You know, sort of sort of thing. So, um, so I think you can make money, you know, finding solutions in areas. You know, people are starting to understand the spending power of this bottom billion people, and it's it's massive. And so now it's thinking about how do you design products specifically for that. So the uh, and this is where I think the 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 impact entrepreneurs is is, is the, they're getting right. And in the past, it was very much people are doing this only for the mission. Uh, and yeah, I think that's true. I think I've heard a couple comments today about people are excited about it, and I think that's true. I think when you talk about something that's impact related, people want to listen, right? They're, they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt of it, certainly from that perspective. But be competitive today, you need to hire the best talent out there, and increasingly, the best talent is going to things that they are passionate about. So they are tired, so really, you know, here's, here's a good testament, really smart people like you in the room, you're not just going out for jobs that, you know, are the most money, you're going out for things that you care about. The other thing, um, sort of, or, or um, uh, another point you're starting to see is that the impact entrepreneurs are starting to build businesses that are moving away from carbon-based energy sources. They, you know, this generation is going to be impacted far more from climate and other issues, uh, sort of some resource challenges, than any other generation before them. And so they are starting, at least in the last you know, couple hundred years. So, um, so I, 
So businesses that can move away from these fluctuating prices and, and that kind of stuff, those are the businesses that are going to be, you know, to be competitive today. Products that improve their customers' health. So it's not about, um, you know, making, you know, the the we, we've got our, companies are removing toxins. They're making food that's healthy for you instead of makes you sick. And those are the types of companies that are going to have people coming back. They're going to have, um, they're not going to have any lawsuits or regulations and those types of things. So companies are getting smarter like that. Paying living wages, not only paying your best um, employees, but also paying sort of the people who may not be, or who may be your frontline employees, or who may be folks who are providing part of the product for you down the road. Being able to build products with the end of their lifestyle or end of their life cycle in mind. I talked a little bit about that. Um, and then understanding that. And this is where um, this is where uh, I, I get a little confused in life. Is that um, you know conservatives in general um, talk about uh, that you know the the economy is the number one need that we have in the world. We just need to keep growing the economy. What they don't, which uh, which I'm confused as to why they miss a step, is that the economy is built on our ecology. So. The foundation of our entire economy is the, the, the raw materials and the, the natural resources that are the supply line of that. So why people are forgetting that, I don't know. Um, but the impact entrepreneur certainly understands that. And they, they're starting to build strategically um, businesses for the future. So finally, um, well, a couple more points. But the next 10 years will not be like the last 10 years. Things will be very different. And, I, and I'm seeing really creative and innovative business models that are, that are proving that to me uh, more and more these days. And it's really exciting to see. And then um, the good news is they won't be alone. People are following them. People are starting to see them getting engaged and moving ahead. And I've just heard you've now created a, um, a minor here uh, for sustainability or, or um, you know something in that, or that arena. You're starting to see more and more of that pop up across the country, and that's because people are drawn to this. And I think this, again, this generation is the most impacted by it, you know, certainly in our lifetime. Um, they're gonna be able to hire the best people, find the best capital, and deal, frankly, with the least amount of regulation, because that will continue to be part of it. But the most important thing is they're gonna have the most loyal customers out there. The customers who are evangelists about you, and your product, your company, those types of things. So I think that the impact entrepreneur Builds your business around solving missions, uh, solving a particular mission, and making money are going to be the ones that attract the most loyal customers. I think it's worth with an eye on, um, uh, appealing to, um, to a social market um, or, or a recent phenomenon. Do you think they'll, they'll reach a market, market saturation where there's so many companies trying to build off a cause that, that consumers will get sort of? Oversaturated with that? So there's a marketing answer to that, and then there's also a business strategy answer to that. And in my opinion, or my belief, is that because of some of those challenges that I talked about with limiting resources, the cost of raw materials and that kind of thing are going to continue to go up. And so businesses that aren't moving in this direction to, to dematerialize and that kind of stuff are just going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Um, and from a you know, I mean, if you look at like organic is like one percent of the market, right? I mean, when it's like eighty-five percent of the market, then we'll worry about you know are we saturating it? But there's so much, and you know, you're talking about probably I don't know five hundred billion or something in revenue, and the economy's multi-trillions now. So I think there's a long way to go before that we bump into those limits. And frankly, we don't know what it's we don't know how to live with seven people, seven billion people on this planet. We are consuming, um, we're, we're consuming resources faster than the planet can regenerate them at this point. Uh, and so that means a couple things. Either we have to get back under that. It's like having you know $1,000 in the bank in your bank account and you take out $100 every month and you get $60 in interest every month, right? You can do it for a while, but eventually you're gonna hit zero. So that's kind of what we're going through right now. So we, we have to get the spend down $59 or get the interest up to $101, or some combination of the two. And so we're so far from understanding what that is yet, I think there's a long way to go. It'll be bumpy, it'll be bumpy, but. Chuck, you talked about the next 10 years won't look like the last 10 years. Can you elaborate a little bit more on where you see the changes and what, the, what you see different in the next 10 years? 
Yeah, I mean, part of it was that, you know, that one graph where I talk a lot about, you know, um, dematerialization and distributed versus centralized. So I think those are going to be different things. I think this, the structure of, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of stuff. So, you know, you looking for jobs, you know, you know, the idea of going to work at some companies is going to start to, you know, not appeal to people, right? They're going to start to have different opinions on stuff. In, in, um, and so, you know, I mean, hate, well, I'll get to this in a second, but so I think it's going to be a combination of, of a lot of these types of things that, you know, raw materials are going to continue to get more expensive, so you're going to have to really change the way you think about products. I think there's opportunities where, um, and you're starting to see, you know, even the, the big guys talk about this, is actually building a product like a, a washing machine. Why do you need to replace your washing machine every year? Let's build a washing machine that'll last like 20 years. And I'm going to charge you by the wash. So now, instead of the consumer being the one that owns it, it's actually the business that owns it. So they're incentivized to figure out how to build it so it'll last forever. And their cost per operation is maybe two cents, and they're charging them three cents or something like that. So they can actually use a business model on it that will actually elongate the time that these materials are, are sort of in our economy and, and not sort of rolling through it. So I think you're going to see a lot of really creative models like that. And, you know, you're, and even you know, even the guys at Walmart are starting to understand that there there's probably limitations to their model of, you know, buying a toilet seat from China for 98 cents and selling it here for three bucks. And so, um, so I, I think you're going to start to see more of these durable good markets that are out there, more sharing. Um, you know, I, there's a, you know, so, so like I think the car industry is is ready for a big shakeup. Um, and two models in particular, I think, are pretty interesting. One is the Uber. Does everyone heard of Uber and know what that is? So, if, if it started off with in San Francisco, if you wanted to get a Lincoln Town Car to come pick you up, um, this is your, you know, the venture capitalists and all the people with a lot of money. But if you want to get a Lincoln Town Car to pick you up, you can pull out your iPhone or, or Android, and sort of show where you're at, and it'll show you all around you where all the cars are, and you can order one and come come pick you up. So, um, you know, where you have like Zipcar and all these other peer-to-peer -peer, um, car sharing opportunities. So the problem is, is that you may not have access to a car in any one of those situations, right? That you, you decide you're gonna do Zipcar today, you show up and your Zipcar's not there, you're trying to reserve your Zipcar's not reserved. But what Uber, the way they're going about it, is they're actually enabling you to have one on demand, and if that's not available, then you can always get a ride from the taxi, right, or from the, the black car. So you always have access. There's never that risk of missing your ride to some place from that perspective. So I think models like that are going to change. And then the other model I think that is interesting on the, um, the, the car sharing, which could, I think, devastate the, the rental car market, frankly, is um, so where are most rental cars rented from? The airport, right? And so when you look out at the airport, what's, what's everything around you besides planes? It's cars, right? It's parking lots full of cars. You know exactly when that person's taking off because they bought a ticket, and exactly when they're landing. So why not, when someone lands, be able to take a car of someone who just, you know, whether it's there for a day or two days or whatever, and know that you got to return it in four days because the person's landing in six days, right? And so you can completely disrupt, completely eliminate the whole need for the rental car market, in my in my opinion. I mean, you, there's 160,000 cars that are parked at airports every day or something crazy like that. There's like 6,000 cars that are rented at airports. Some, some, you know, the, the, I don't know, those aren't the exact numbers, but it's something like that. You wouldn't even need the rental car. So that industry may, frankly, go away. You know, I don't know. So I, the, there's some interesting things like that that I think we'll, we'll see some big disruptions.